Buon pomeriggio a tutti. Uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, non so se ci siano persone che non parlano l'italiano uh, presenti, ma uh, ci è stato detto di fare la presentazione in inglese, quindi passo all'inglese. <laughs> good afternoon everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, today's uh, speaker in our uh, colloquium of the Faculty of Science, uh, Professor Umberto Bottazzini from the University of Milan. Umberto is a, a leading uh, historian of mathematics at the international level, uh, certainly I would say the most eminent uh, Italian scholar in the field. Uh, Umberto has uh, had a, a very distinguished uh, career and uh, I'm going to give you a, a brief summary. Uh, His degree is in mathematics, so he's a bona fide mathematician. <laughs> Not all the historians of mathematics are. Um, he was associate professor for the history of mathematics uh, from 1977 until uh, 1990, uh, first at the University of Calabria, then uh, at the University of Bologna, which is where I had uh, the good fortune of, of meeting uh, Umberto. And then he became, uh, oh, he also taught uh, in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Pisa, briefly, uh, in 1990, uh, 89, 1990. And then became a full professor, first at the University of Palermo, and then uh, um, at the University of Milan. Uh, he also had uh, positions at CISA, Trieste, and uh, Università San Raffaele in, in Milan. And um, since 2004, he is professor for the history of mathematics in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Milan. He's had uh, a number of appointments as a visiting professor in France, uh, Sweden, England, uh, Belgium, uh, MIT, and, uh, and many other places, including uh, places in Italy like uh, the Ius in Pavia. He also uh, has been a uh, uh, corresponding member of the Académie Internationale d'Histoire des Sciences, uh, member of the scientific board of Centro Federico Enriquez. I'm giving you here only a short uh, summary of the many, many activities uh, uh, of Umberto. He's uh, won a number of recognitions for his work. Uh, for instance, in 2006, received the Pythagora Prize uh, of the Città di Crotone for the best work in the popularization of mathematics. Most importantly, in 2013, he was elected a fellow of the American Mathematical Society, of the inaugural class, in fact. And in 2015, uh, Umberto won the Albert Leon Whiteman Memorial Prize, which is the, perhaps the most prestigious prize, one of the most prestigious prizes in the, for historians of mathematics. And this is a prize uh, also of the American Mathematical Society. He's organized a number of workshops in places like uh, Cortona, uh, Lumini, uh, Centro de Giorgi, He's been uh, numerous times invited to Oberwolfach and such, uh, such venues. He's a member of uh, way too many journals, uh, uh, editorial boards for me to mention. Most important, uh, the Archive for the History of Exact Science and Historia Mathematica, of which he was also uh, editor-in-chief. Uh, he has lectured widely uh, around the world including uh, an invited 45-minute lecture at the International Congress of Mathematicians in Beijing in 2002. Uh, Umberto has written many articles, but it's probably best known uh, uh, for his books, uh, starting with uh, Il Calcolo Sublime, uh, Storia dell'Analisi Matematica da Euler uh, Weierstrass, uh, which was later translated uh, by Springer, uh, Flauto di Hilbert, uh, and in general, uh, uh, numerous books uh, on the history of what I would call modern mathematics, beginning in the late uh, 18th century, but is focusing especially on 19th century analysis, both real and complex analysis. Uh, more recently, uh, he has published a couple of books on what we could call uh, high-level popularization of mathematics with Il Mulino, Numeri and uh, Infinito. Uh, he's also a frequent contributor to uh, cultural pages of newspapers. In particular, I was impressed to read that he's authored some 500 columns for uh, the Inserto Domenicale del Sole 24 Ore, so, which <laughs> is quite impressive. He's currently involved uh, in the edition of uh, the complete works of D'Alembert, 
in particular volume four on the vibrating string, and also the edition of the uh, national edition of the works of Federigo Enriquez. Uh, so Umberto has been a visitor in Pisa here before. He knows very well the, the archives here, especially uh, Betty's correspondence. I want to add a personal note. In 1986-1987, I had the good luck of being uh, following his lectures in Bologna on the history of mathematics, and I, I kept the notes uh, to these days. So, without further ado, uh, Umberto, please. Thanks. That's the weakness of the age. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you, thank you, <coughs> Michele, for this uh, uh, very nice and very kind presentation. I'm very honored to be here, and uh, probably I have to learn this. Absolutely. Yeah. Start again, or? <laughs> no. And, uh, yeah, so the, the subject of my talk is, uh, is not the, uh, the sea, but it's the infinite in a various uh, way of understanding it. Um, the sea is uh, a sort of metaphor suggested by various authors. To begin with, there is a nice uh, sentence by Nietzsche, uh, on, uh, taken from the joyful wisdom, where he said, uh, forget the, the last line, there's nothing is more frightful than infinity. So the idea is that uh, infinity is uh, a frightful uh, concept, and uh, and the uh, and the idea that the ocean is uh, so a terrific image for that is not Nietzsche, but only Nietzsche, but also many authors in the time have used this uh, metaphor, like uh, Bonaventura Cavalieri. And then at that time, th this was suggested, I think, by the, by the great navigators who sailed the ocean to, to explore the, the new continents. And uh, uh, Cavalieri, for instance, after receiving uh, Galileo uh, discourses, uh, say, new sciences, discourses and mathematical demonstrations, has his master saying that with the spirit of your supreme genius, you succeeded in easily sailing the immense ocean of the indivisible, the vacuum and the infinite. And also, speaking of himself, he said that he was able to uh, read the heaven, to, to the heaven, the boat, not that Nietzsche's, but his own boat, does a travel the ocean of the infinity, of the indivisibles, avoiding to uh, crashing on the rocks of that infinity. Uh, another author who is interesting in this respect is uh, Fontenelle. Fontenelle uh, was uh, secretaire perpetuel of the French Academy for some 40 years or so. He died when he was almost 100. And uh, uh, in, uh, 18, in 727, he published a book anonymously, but everybody knew that was Fontenelle, the author, on the elements of geometry. And that is an interesting book because uh, uh, he got a, a a number of reactions, including that from Weiss, uh, sorry, from Leibniz, and later on from Cantor and Veronese and others. But at that time, Fontenelle wrote that uh, there is two kinds of infinites. One is the metaphysical one, a magnitude without limits in all the senses, which includes everything and out of which there is nothing. And then there is the, what he called the geometrical infinite. That means a magnitude greater than any finite magnitude, but not greater than any magnitude. And so the conclusion in this way, in his eyes, is that there are infinities smaller or greater than other. And uh, look at the, the first instance. 
he says that geometrical infinity gives rise to the incommensurable, whose number, whose number is infinitely greater than the commensurable. So apparently, what does it mean? That the irrational number are infinitely many more than the rational? Uh, proving that was one of the, uh, the great results by Cantor. So apparently, uh, Fontanelle had this kind of I would say insight or intuition or whatever. And then there is a, a, a nice picture provided by him when he says, it is said that in the Netherlands, large expanses of land have been covered by the sea and only the tips of the bell tower <laughs> emerge or scatter here and there. And it's more or less like this, that in the ocean of the infinity has submerged all the numbers and all the magnitudes and only the commensurable uh, can emerge or you can uh, perfectly know. So the rational number <laughs> emerge in the sea of the continuum, the sea of the number, the rational number. Um, uh, Fontenelle was um, a very a peculiar uh, figure, character, and uh, it is nice to read what Leibniz said of him uh, when he, Leibniz, realized that Fontenelle wanted to uh, uh, write a book like The Element of Geometry. So uh, Leibniz was not very, I say, enthusiastic or happy about this project because he was not very confident in Fontenelle's quality as a mathematician. But that is another story. So because we thought of irrational, uh, one could say that the discovery of uh, uh, irrational number was the, someone has said, the first crisis in the history of mathematics. Uh, I just take a picture of the uh, um, regular pentagon because it's um, one of the first example of uh, uh, irrational ratio. That the, uh, I'm sorry, that means that the, the ratio between the diagonal and the side of the pentagon is given by the, uh, the golden ratio, this is an irrational number. But it's also interesting because this picture has a story as uh, represented on your, on the right by this image from uh, the Occulta Philosophia from Cornelius Agrippas and everybody can recognize uh, the first instance of Leonardo's, uh, what is called Vitruvius Man, and uh, one hero has this uh, on the, uh, by, by Leonardo, not by Agrippa. Anyway, I, I'm interested in this because there is recently has been published um, a correspondence between Herman, uh, between Andrew Vale and his sister Simone, and it, this is quite interesting in this respect, concerning the, in many respects, but in this part in particular, concerning the, the irrational number. So let me quote what André wrote. At that time he was in, in jail, in uh, Rouen, because um, it was at the beginning, in 1940, France was in war, he, he came from uh, Norway, so, uh, and uh, at that time he was waiting for the trial. And so he wrote to his sister, the fact that there are ratios that cannot be named, and uh, for the Pythagoreans, uh, a name ratio is between two uh, whole numbers. That means that there have been logoi allogoi, and the expression itself is so overwhelming that I can't believe that in such a so dramatic era, uh, which has known and felt anguish to such an extent, a fact so extraordinary could have been taken for a simple, a simple scientific discovery. That is Andre, and the reply 
No, sorry. Again, I, I, I Andre to Simon. Um, he said that the great importance attributed to the proportion suggests that the, at the beginning of Greek thought, there was a feeling of disproportion between thought and word. And addressing his sister, as you say, between human and God. Of such an intensity that they had need to throw and it caused a bridge above that abyss. And Nietzsche, that is because I've mentioned Nietzsche at the beginning, Nietzsche meditated more than anyone else on archaic Greek thoughts. Uh, that is nice, Simone. I can't stand Nietzsche. He exasperated me. Even when he expressed a thing, I think. <laughs> that is <bad. laughs> Okay. Uh, uh, <clears throat> that is interesting. I, I, I will suggest you to meditate on this statement by André. He says that what makes Greek mathematics extremely original is perhaps the fact that approximation does not exist. <coughs> approximation does not exist. Uh, this killed the number for the benefit of logos, and that is the drama of the discovery of the irrational. Uh, quite recently, uh, a colleague of mine, or the, of us, I would say, that Paolo Zellini has published a number of books on this subject, and is is claiming exactly the contrary, that the, the beginning of all that is that just approximation, not uh, uh, the approximation does not exist, as Andre Weil claimed at that time. Anyway, sure, says Raymond, there was a drama of immense scope, and the disclosure of the discovery of the irrationals has thrown on the nation of truth a discredit that still lasts nowadays. And it reaches a progress that ended up destroying a learning civilization and with the Roman weapons finally killing Greece. And the conclusion is that God have been right to let Hippasus of Metapontum perish in a break because of this, because he, uh, as you know, was responsible, according to the Jamblicus, that uh, to let known that the, the, the rational has been discovered in the in the particular legal circle. Uh, to characterize the uh, the irrational uh, numbers or the incommensurable magnitudes, Euclid uses what is called the antifarisis. Is an algorithm of repeated subtraction applied to homogeneous quantities. And in book two, one of the arithmetic books of the elements, Euclid states that, uh, you see, when the less of two unequal magnitudes are continually subtracted in turn from the greater, greater that which is left never measure the one before it, so the first one, that means that the magnitudes will be incommensurable. So let's shortly look at the infinite in the antiquity. For Anaximander and for all the pre-Socratic philosophers of nature, infinite has taken the form of the apparent, the indefinite, the unbounded, a kind of principle, says uh, Aristotle. Uh, who says it's difficult, raises difficult in everyone, and, uh, and the question is, where does the belief that there is something infinite comes from? And answer by Aristotle is that time. Time is in fact infinite. That is a quite crude, I would say, statement and not proven by Aristotle anymore. And then from the division of the magnitude as used by the mathematician. However, you know, uh, infinite as such can be known. And we must not believe in an infinite that can exist actually. So all that reminds us to conclude that exists potentially. 
And this kind of distinction was accepted and repeated for centuries. Uh, Anaxagoras says that in the small there is no small end. That means that you can continue the division uh, as far as you want. Uh, <coughs> accordingly, the continuum cannot be put together out of discrete elements. And that is an, a question, an important question because one of the main questions discussed from the antiquity until yesterday is how is made up the this continuum or the continuum. Um, the infinite show up itself first in the continuum, say Aristotle. Uh, that is because infinite is often used in definition of continuous. For instance, that is infinitely divisible is continuous. And uh, that means that if you, as Aristotle does, uh, think that the, the, a point is an indivisible with position, that implies that the strike line is not made by points. A collection of points, however large, cannot give rise to something divisible like a line. And uh, according to Aristotle, the straight line is continuous and the point is indivisible. Therefore, it's impossible that something continuous is composed by indivisible. And this thesis was repeated many times. For instance, by Roger Bacon, and his opus Marius stated that any body is uh, infinitely divisible, yet it is not for this reason that the world will be composed by infinite material parts, called atoms. And the example he provides is the following. Suppose that this is true. So consider a square and a diagonal, and then send the line parallel to the to the basis. So you, you put a one-to-one -one correspondence between the side and the diagonal. And uh, this establishes a correspondence that is a point-to-point -point correspondence. It, uh, and the, the conclusion is that the, the side and diagonal are equal. And uh, if a doctor mirabilis back on argues this way, so the doctor subtilis cannot do that. <laughs> certainly uh, be outdone. And so even Dan Scotus uh, provided a similar example with two circles instead of a square uh, with two circles and the rays uh, coming out from the common center. And uh, later in the uh, 17th century, Libertus Fromundus from Louvain was a mathematician and theologian. Uh, addressed philosopher, mathematician, and so on, to fight atomism. And one of the argument was that if space and time were composed of extended divisibles, not even a wind horse could reach the tortoise that has a certain, a certain advantage. And uh, at this, uh, the, one of the Zeno paradox. The first one is the paradox of the arrow. Yeah, everybody knows, I think, no, the arrow cannot uh, uh, reach the, 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 the target. And so if you're supposed to have a mobile point, it cannot uh, travel from a point A to a point B of a line because before it should reach the middle and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, how to uh, solve this kind of paradoxes? According to Aristotle, the solution, the Achilles is the same, the solution is, is provided by a definition of the infinite in two, in two meanings. One is infinite by division, the other one is by extremis, that means by length. In the second meaning, uh, it is certainly impossible to touch the various points of, in a finite time. 
Instead, it's possible if the infinitives are uh, thought of as uh, according to the division, because in that case, also the time is infinite in the same way. Uh, so uh, the conclusion by Aristotle is that it is not absurd that uh, in infinite time we travel along infinite elements of points. As Borges says, ignorant people suppose that infinite draws require infinite time. In the Lottery of Babylon is the, the novel. It's enough, in fact, that time is infinitely divisible as the, uh, the famous parable of the race with the turtle teaches. Uh, Achilles is the same. Uh, suppose, assume that Tortoise has a head start of length one on Achilles, who runs twice as fast as the Tortoise. So you get this uh, geometric series converged to two. And according to Weil, this could be a hint by which today one might think to resolve the paradox. One might think to. But Achilles exhausting all the infinitely many partial distance as chopped off walls is contrary to the essence of infinity as unfinishable. And uh, Weiss, Hermann Weiss, and not Andre Weiss, Hermann Weiss goes on discussing the, uh, con the idea of a continuum that Aristotle had. According to Aristotle, when you divide a continuous line, a segment, say, in two halves, you take the one dividing point for two. You make it both the beginning and the end. Uh, and in doing this, in dividing in this way, neither the line nor the motion remains continuous. The motion of the Achilles, for instance, remains continuous. Uh, uh, of course, you have to think in, uh, uh, not in actual term, but in potential term. On the contrary, everybody knows in this room that according to Dedekind, uh, the statement that there is one, only one point which divides uh, a segment into two parts is an action that characterizes, according to data, the essence of the continuity and allows him to prove the equivalence between arithmetic and uh, geometric continuum. So that is, uh, I will come back on this later uh, mention again what, what uh, Hermann Wald says in this respect. As for the composition of the continuum, not only Aristotle, but Hegel says that a sum of points does not produce a line. The reason is that if you think the line as a set, a menge, says Hegel, of points, the continuum is reduced to discrete. So it's impossible that uh, Menge is, uh, of course, the word used by Cantor. It's impossible that uh, a continuum be made by of points. And Paul du Bois-Raymond uh, repeated the same, argued that in a static conception of space, like that of Dedekind and Cantor, uh, a static conception of space cannot generate the notion of uniform line as defined rigorously by a however dense sequence of points. Why? Since all the points have no dimension, and therefore, however dense it may be, the sequence of points can never become an interval, which must always be considered as the sum of interval. So the continuous the continuous line is the sum of continuous interval, and not of point. Uh, this kind of argument is taken, was repeated, if you want, by Kant in the, in the proof of the antithesis of the second antinomy of the reason, 
and is also taken up by Veronese in the foundation of geometry, he claims that the point is not part of a continuous straight line, and that all the points can, that can be imagined in it, however many they are, taken together do not constitute a continuous. Uh, that's Veronese, one more, something more than one century ago, but after all, all that comes back from Aristotle. Uh, since a point cannot be continuous with a point, he denied that a line can be composed of point. And he uh, made it, it, a suggestion of a comparison with time. A point is like now or the instant is an indivisible in time, not a part of the time. An instant can be the beginning, the end of the division of time. And similarly, a point can be the beginning, the end, or the division of a line, but not part of it. Uh, almost the same words are mentioned by Laplace in his Leçon de Mathematique à l'école normale. Come back to Hermann Weyl in 1927. He claimed that the continuum, or the variable, is represented by a sequence of choice in becoming, created step by step by unconditional choices that are independent of one another. Don't ask me what does it mean, but... Uh, therefore, according to Weil, it is necessary, remains, it necessarily, sorry, uh, remains in statu nascenti, while a sequence that given ad infinitum by a law represents a single real number belonging to the continuum. Uh, Weil, no, this is a paper on the philosophy of mathematics, Philosophie der Mathematik, in 1927. And in that paper, Weil stated that according to Brouwer, the continuum is not composed by par of parts, like Aristotle. And Weiss added that in the intuition conception, find a precise mathematical formulation and all the truth expressed by Aristotle. So you see, it's not uh, so far away. Um, because we think, uh, we, we speak of uh, Continuum and Aristotle, let me mention in passing uh, a very known, well-known example, Aristotle Wills, uh, mentioned by, uh, discussed by Galileo. Um, you see, the question is, how can the smaller circle running along the, the, the line BC, no, BF, sorry, traverse a length greater than the, its circumference? unless it go by jumps. And Sagredo say that's a very difficult question, very intricate matter. Uh, so the answer by Galileo is that there is a sort of, take look at the, at the uh, hexagon over there. You see there are dotted lines and continuous lines. If, uh, you think of a circle as a, a polygon having an infinitude of sides, the line traversed by the continuous distributed infinitude of sides in the greater equal, uh, uh, in the greater circle, equal the line laid down by the infinitude of sides in the smaller, with the exception of an infinity, num an infinitely many uh, empty spaces. Just like in the uh, example of the hexagon. And since the sides are not finite in number but infinite, so the empty space are not finite but infinite. Uh, and simply just says this building up of lines uh, out of points, uh, divisible out of indivisible, uh, infinite out of infinity offers me an obstacle difficult to avoid. Not, not to mention the vacuum, conclusively refuted by Aristotle. 
I saw Salviati say, remember that we are dealing with the infinities that uh, both uh, the indivisible, that both transcend our understanding. And then there is the, the example of the bowl, is another fantasy of paradoxical nature produced by Galileo in that book. The question is, how can a single point be equal to a line? Uh, shortly, imagine to rotate this figure around CF, so you get a cylinder, a cone, and a sphere, and that take up the sphere, and so what remains is the bowl. And I cut this with uh, planes parallel to the basis, and so uh, you get that figure, and the uh, and the, uh, the the section uh, shows that they are equal, the section of the cone and the section of the ball, and then suppose to uh, have your cutting plank coming near and near to the top, and so in the end you get a point, that is the vertex V, and the line, that is the, the, the circle. Uh, and uh, as they are still equal, in the end they should be equal. And Sagredo says, to deface so beautiful a structure by a blunt pedantic attack would be nothing short of sinful. And who is the, making a blunt pedantic attack? This is Cavalieri. Cavalieri say, if you look at this picture, in the end there is no plane and there is no section, and the fact that the, uh, on one side you have a, a, a circumference and the other side a point has nothing to do because it is no plane, the line, as much as the point. So now this is a question very interesting because it involves the so-called law of continuity. Is the behavior of a sequence of continuous functions continuous in the limits? This is the source of one of the mistakes, entre guillemets, by Cauchy, for instance. Uh, <coughs> one other interesting question is the following, arises by Simplicius. Since it's clear that we may have a strike line greater than another, each containing an infinite number of points, we are forced to think, or to admit, that we have two or many different kinds of infinity, one greater than the other. Because the infinity of points in the long linear is greater than the infinity of points in the shorter. Uh, yeah, that is uh, a difficult arising but with our finite mind try to discuss the infinite, yes. Then there is the example I don't mention because everybody knows that, the, the number and the square. But what to conclude? The conclusion of Galileo is that the attribute equal, greater, and less are not applicable to infinite, but only to infinite quantity. And again, uh, answering to example by Simplicio, I answer that one line does not, con no, you, you have different segments, shorter and longer. One line does not contain more or less or just as many points as another. But that each line contains an infinite number. Yeah, one would say infinitely many, that's sure. But as many, not uh, as many in the sense of Cantor. And Galileo said, no, it's not the case. Again, uh, he, uh, there is a, an answer by Galileo to uh, Rocco. This, uh, I would recommend to look at this uh, uh, um, paper by Galileo. It's very, it's amusing actually. Rocco uh, claims that it's false thinking of a line made up by points, and so it's false that the sphere. Uh, is tangent to a plane in a point, at a point. Why? P 
because it would follow against Aristotle that a line is composed of points. Uh, uh, Galileo answered that uh, it's true that continuous consists of always divisible parts, and so it's very true that the line is composed of points and a continuum of indivisible. Open your eyes and look. Uh, 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 open your eyes at the light that has perhaps concealed so far, and you will clearly see that the continuous is made up uh, divisible. Uh, okay, this uh, indivisible are not quanta, to use Galileo term, for if they are infinitely many, quanta would compose an infinite quantum, a big one, of course, and not... Uh, it's interesting to remark that this is not just a question of mathematics, a matter of mathematics, but a matter of theology. And the Jesuits declared that the continuous composite of indivisible is not only in contrast with the common Aristotelian doctrine, but also in probability itself, and therefore forbidden in our company. And uh, uh, in 1651, uh, among the, the, the philosophical theses that were condemned, condemned, there was statement like, the continuous of sequence consists only of indivisible, or the infinite can be enclosed between two units or two points. That is what Galileo said, for instance. And... Uh, not only the Jesuit, but also Spinoza in the Ethics mentioned the fact that there are some who pretend that the line is made up of points, and then they are good at finding that, uh, uh, finding arguments to show that it can not be divided infinitely, and in fact is not let absolute to argue that the body substance is made up of parts, and the body is uh, made up of surfaces and surfaces of line and line of points. All that is absurd, according to Spinoza. And the infinites appear also when we look outside the, the mathematics and look on the sky. And uh, and one of the of the discussion arose in 1606 when a new star appeared in the sky. And Kepler, commenting on this, and this De Stella Nova, reacted uh, sarcastically against the sect of philosopher who uh, come from the ancient school of pagan philosopher and uh, are lost, in his view, in inexplicable labyrinths, as happened to the unfortunate Giordano. Giordano Bruno, who makes the word infinity in such a way that uh, how many are the fixed stars, so many are the worlds. That was Bruno's. And uh, in this respect, Kepler said that uh, thinking of this, wandering in this immensity, uh, provoked to him a kind of horror. How is possible that the universe is infinite? Asked Elpino to Filoteo in the dialogue of the infinite universe at by, by Bruno. And I asked him, how is possible that it is finite? You cannot prove with the senses. You cannot prove with the senses you have a notion of, inf notion of infinite. Uh, and Filoteo, that is Bruno, uh, claims that the immense space that we can call vacuous, in which there are innumerable and infinite globes like this one, like the Earth, and this, uh, with this kind of infinite, there is no reason that should be finite. And in his view, all this would 
uh, celebrate God's greatness by countless sons and infinite words. But unfortunately, the fathers of the Inquisition <laughs> did not agree with that. Uh, Calvino said that Bruno was a great visionary, cosmologist, and in Borg's opinions, uh, uh, Bruno proclaimed that this was this a statement repeated many times at that time. We can say that with certainty that the universe is all center, or that the center of the universe is everywhere, and its circumference is nowhere. And, uh, and that is uh, uh, taken by a, a Liber Philosophorum, an hermetic test. Uh, contrary to that, uh, Kepler claimed that the universe has a finite spherical shape because it's the bodily image of God. Uh, mundus est imago dei corporea. Uh, what say Galileo? Uh, he said he was not able to support the finiteness of the universe and uh, in, in, uh, in the dialogue said Salviati, as Galileo says, neither you, Simplicio, nor anybody else uh, has ever proved that the world is finite and endowed in, with any figure or inf infinite and unending or unending. Unending as Leopardi's space in the, po in the, in the infinite. Pascal also repeats what Bruno, the theoretic Bruno says, that uh, the space is an infinite sphere whose center is everywhere and circumference is nowhere. And Leibniz said, look, these are, this kind of expression should not be taken strictly because they are somehow like the imaginary. Not rigorous, but useful. And, uh, and Pascal not only is terrified by the infinite spaces, but the eternal ceilings. He's terrified, that all that terrifies me, say Pascal. And uh, that's interesting, the, the, the comment by Borges. Pascal was reflect for us the vertigo of a theologian exiled from the orb of the Almagest and lost in the Copernican universe of Kepler and, and Bruno. As I mentioned Leopardi, so he asked, uh, the infinite is a, an idea, a dream, and not a reality. We have no proof of its existence, not even by analogy. Uh, we can say that we are at an infinite distance from cognition and demonstration of our, such an existence. Indeed, uh, that's interesting. It's written about in the 20s. It could be somehow disputed if the infinite is possible, something that some modern have denied, and if this idea, daughter of our imagination, is not contradictory in itself, that is, false in the metaphysics. At that time, more or less at that time, Bolzano was thinking of the paradoxes of infinite and uh, emphasized the properties that we have seen was discussed by Simplicio and Galileo. That is, the property that infinite sets, we'd say, uh, can be uh, put in one-to-one uh, -one correspondence to each other. Uh, that is a high remarkable peculiarity which can occur and actually occurs in the relationship of two multitudes if they are both infinite. Uh, it's possible that one of these multitudes contains the other in itself as a mere part. So, that is exactly what Dedekind would say in his book 
on the natural and meaning of numbers. When, by definition, a system, a set, say, is said be infinite, when it's similar, that means uh, in one-to-one -one correspondence, to a proper part of itself. So, if you want the infinite, in some way, precede ontologically the finite. And uh, let me just mention in passing this, I already mentioned Dedek in the, his action, but at that time when he wrote the paper on continuity and irrational number, he, he got in touch with Cantor, and uh, Cantor in his letter asked this kind of question to his friend. Is it possible to establish a one-to-one -one correspondence between real numbers and natural numbers? Um, some time later, he was able to say no, and then I found a clear difference between the so-called continuum and the set of all algebraic numbers. Actually, it, more correctly, Dedekind found a clear difference, and Cantor published it as a, his own discovery, but that's a, a, another story. The set of algebraic number is the number of the real number is not, as the power of continuous. And, uh, and in, a, in a paper published in 1882, he said that it occurs often that the concept of potential and actual infinite get confused. And so there are two forms of actual infinite, namely the transfinite and the absolute. The transfinite is that of interest of Cantor. And uh, the question is, does a transfinite cardinal number between the power and so the rational, say, number and the continuum exist? As you know, that is uh, an hypothesis with which uh, Cantor try many for many years to, to, uh, to prove what in the end was unable, although he stated he, was, he had proved it, but it was not true. But, so the, 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 the hypothesis is that the, the power of the continuum immediately follows the power of the uh, denumerable. And so I will mention this as the problem, the first problem actually, of uh, celebrated talk by Hilbert, that uh, every system of infinitely many real numbers is either equivalent to the, the assembly, the set of the natural integral, or the set of all real numbers, and therefore to the continuum. That is to the points of the line. So you see, the, the story which began with Aristotle and so on and so forth, arrived to this point, but this is the beginning of another story because uh, from here onwards, uh, the question, the continuous hypothesis and so on and so forth is a, a topic discussed by uh, set theorists, logicians and so on and so forth, but I will stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Umberto, for the very interesting presentation. I'm opening the floor uh, for questions or comments. Well, I'll ask a question. <laughs> okay. I was uh, curious uh, by the opening statement uh, where you quoted Andre Weil said that what was so original in Greek mathematics was that there was no approximation. And, and that, indeed, that seems uh, to contradict... Uh, for instance, much of uh, Archimedes' uh, work. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Uh, uh, yes and no. That means, <laughs> uh, yeah, one could say, okay, uh, Archimedes came later, very later, with respect to the discovery of the rational number. And uh, so it seems that 
could be an answer, but in fact it's not, because it's true that Archimedes provides approximation of pi, for instance. And so I don't know what Andre Weil meant by saying that in the Greek thought there is no approximation. Uh, I would say I disagree, but as is Andre Weil, so I'm <laughs> slightly hesitating to say. <laughs> so it seems to me instead that uh, we have many instances of approximation of uh, square of two, for instance, in uh, ancient culture, not in Greek, or not only in Greek culture, but in Babylonian, Babylonian culture, for instance, or in Indian culture and so on, and in Egyptian culture. So it seems that the approximation of a uh, uh, a rational number like square of two was sort of common achievement by different mathematical culture. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay.